What we have here is an incredibly sad looking Zenith computer. You can see a singular light there at the front. That's a power LED, I'd assume, anyway, if there's even an LED behind that, which I think there is. It's got two bays. One of them, there's only one of them that's full, the other one is empty. There used to be two floppy drives. This is actually an XT clone. I don't think this floppy drive actually even works very well. Here's a five and a quarter inch floppy this got. It should clamp down on this. And it doesn't. Unless maybe it requires power in order to work. So, I don't know, that may be broken. I may have to replace that. This thing is definitely a lot heavier than it would look at first glance. I'm not sure if the ZF-158-42 is the correct model or if the EIA-416 is. I'm going to say it's the ZF. You can see it's multi-voltage, takes up 3 amps. There's our serial number. Wired for 120 volts AC. Made in USA. There's a UL listing sticker. There's the power supply with the hardware power switch. You can set it for both 115 and 230 if you wanted to, but obviously for North America, we're going to set it to 115. Disconnect line cord before opening. Fuse located inside. Then over here, we've got an FCC ID sticker. Then if we take a look, we can see the uh, expansion card slots. We'll see one that's rather large here. Well, two of them that are rather large. Another one that's also non-standard size. And obviously you can tell this thing has been pilfered. Once we pop the cover, we'll continue to see just how sad a shape this thing really is in. Look at that rotten foam. I'm going to have to get that all out of there. There's a fan on the side for the power supply. There used to be a sticker here. I think I still have that sticker. Let me go see if I can find that. There you go. I stuck the label back inside, and then you can get an idea as to what it says. In both English and French. I did actually glue it back into place with wood glue. <laughs> that was the kind of glue I had handy. So you can see the back of this. If you're ever wondering what a five and a quarter inch floppy drive actually looks like, here you go. Here's the clamping mechanism in action. We can also see one other thing about this system. I'll turn on the video light. This isn't your typical motherboard setup. It's actually a backplane board, which has got very minimal logic. We can see you know, there's a couple of resistors there, a couple of capacitors. There's a connection there for something. Those two pins, I don't know what that would go to. And of course, power supply, but there's not much else. All the logic is on these expansion risers. This, I believe, right here, this one is the system board itself. Actually, no, that was not the system board. That's the video board and serial port. So you can see there's a composite video output, and that is composite, although it's mono, mono uh, monochrome. <laughs> there is a 9-pin video connection. Most people probably have never seen that before. I believe that in this case, we would have some kind of monographics. It might be... MCGA, which is kind of an oxymoron when you consider that CGA is color graphics array, but there's a 25-pin serial port, and there's a parallel port, keyboard port, and some other thing. I don't know what that actually is. Here we go. Now, this is something you won't see every day. The only external connection is this little three-pin header over here. But, you can see if we have a look, Corvus Systems, Inc., PC bus transporter trademark made in Taiwan. There's a model number up there. And there's a lot of chips here. See, this appears to be a ROM of some kind. There's another there's a lot of ROMs here. There's some RAM chips. There's probably presumably the controller up there. Some Toshiba items. I should probably look all this up. That's a Motorola chip. I think that's Motorola. And that would be Motorola as well. But it looks like it bears a Corvus copyright on it. Maybe that's a Corvus logo. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's Motorola. No, it's not Motorola. That's Motorola. So I have no idea what that is. Somebody will probably correct me in the comments and tell me I'm a moron. But what this actually is, is it was for Corvus Omninets. And if you're wondering what that is, 
that was a system where you had a centralized hard drive and you had multiple computers that could access the hard drive. That's what this card was for. I'm abstracting a lot of the details because I don't know what the details are. I should probably look it up and research it a little bit further. But this cord, this cord, this card is pretty useless to me because I don't have a Corvus OmniNet and I don't really have any way to make one. But I wonder why something like that would have been in here. Although, considering that it doesn't have any fixed disk storage, it's just floppy diskette drives, well, I think the need for that is pretty obvious. You know, of course, all that is great, but does it work? Well, I don't know. We're going to find out. I really hope that this doesn't explode, because that's a very real possibility with something that's this old that probably has not seen power in, well, a whole bunch of years. As Wilkes 85 would put it, a couple of centuries. Probably hasn't seen power this millennium, certainly. But we're going to do it. I don't know if it's turned on or if it's not. Well, if it works, it's not on. Here we go. I'm getting goosebumps. Let's see what happens. Where's the power switch at the back? Holy crap. Well, it comes on. It's amazing. Invalid keyboard code. Well, that's okay, because I don't have a keyboard. I don't think it'll focus on that. Have you got some synchronization issues with the, with the TV? I don't think it's very happy with the input that it's getting. <laughs> it comes on, though. Didn't explode in my face. I don't even smell anything that's exploded. I wonder if it would boot. I don't think so. I think it needs a keyboard in order to start. So, of course, that's understandable. You'd probably want a keyboard to use the computer. So we'll turn that off. See if I can find... Oh, we got a floppy diskette here. Put that in there. I don't think this is going to work. No, that does not work. It could be that it doesn't like this cable, which is also certainly possible. I can't really read it anymore. It's just getting worse. Let me see if I can fix that. But I do have one other curious thing. There's a switch on the back here, right above the keyboard port. What does that switch do? Where's the switch? There it is. A lot of nothing. <laughs> we'll turn it off. That high pitch whine coming from this TV is really irritating. We'll turn it on with the switch on. See what happens. Realistically, I'm going to have to get a proper monitor for this. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any difference. I'd imagine there's something in software that that would do. But, I do know that it works, and that's going to conclude the video. I think that was rather interesting. Oh yeah, one more thing. It was pointed out to me by UXW Bill that there are... How many are down there? I think there's five green status LEDs down there. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six red status LEDs on the main board. So when I fire this up... They should all come on, and they do. It's there in the power on self test. All of them except for that one red light at the back turn off. All the green status LEDs on the board are on. If you want to, I don't think you'll be able to read that. I don't think I can control the. Well, maybe. Invalid slash no keyboard code received, which would stand to reason because I have no keyboard hooked up. I don't have an XT keyboard. But at least I'll know that it'll actually be worth getting one. Also be worth looking for a monitor, too. 
So there you go. That's all. Nothing else needs to be said.